Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 19th, 2011, and my guest is Nassim Taleb. His newest book is Anti-Fragility. Nassim, welcome back to Econ Talk. Oh, thank you for inviting me. You were uh, the, I, I, I remember I did my first Econ Talk on the day of the release of The Black Swan. Oh, that's so nice. That's so fun. Now, this book is in process. It's not finished. You estimate it's roughly a year away. So yeah. we're here to have a conversation about a project that is in progress and I know a lot of listeners out there are very jealous because I've had the privilege of reading the, the manuscripts, not the final book. It's it's in process, but uh, I, those of you out there are excited, you're going to have to – this will have to satisfy you for maybe about a year. But we'll uh, – uh, say nine months, nine months. Okay. Well, that's a good gestation period. Um, now, you start off with a very provocative idea, which is – the title of the book is a little bit strange. It's – I don't think it's a word in the English language, anti-fragility. And you start off by asking, what is the opposite of fragile? And of course, we think we know what that is. The opposite of fragile is robust, you say. It might be unbreakable. But you argue that's not really the right way to think about the opposite. It doesn't capture what the essence of fragility. So why do we need another term? Because if you send a package uh, by mail uh, to your cousin in Australia and it has uh, champagne glasses, you write fragile on it. It, it, it there's something that's robust, you don't write anything on a package. You don't say, uh, you know, I don't care, you can do whatever you want. So the, the for the fragile, the upper bound is comes back unharmed or, or gets to destination unharmed. And, of course, at worst, as it worst, it's completely destroyed. So that's the fragile. The robust has an upper bound of unharmed and a lower bound of unharmed. And the, 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 the anti-fragile, it would be a package on which you'd write, uh, please mishandle because a lower bound would be unharmed, and the upper bound would be it would be it would be improved. You'd get instead of sending six champagne glasses, you, you'd eight would arrive. Exactly, <laughs> exactly like like in mythology, or they'd be stronger, better glasses somehow. Exactly, or in mythology, it's like Hydra. You cut one head, two grow back. So the robust would be more like Phoenix. You shoot it, it comes back. So the the upper bound and lower bound are both you know uh, unharmed. And and with Hydra, Hydra wants harm. So when I first read that idea, I thought, okay, that's interesting. That's true. But why is it relevant? I mean, there are not that many Hydras around. Life doesn't, uh, you'd think, consist of Hydras. But much of the book is to co- convinces me and the reader that actually anti-fragile is a very powerful idea. So why is that? Why is it important? Where where is it relevant in our lives? Well, I mean, the, the first the first thing uh, that the, the, the reason I had that I discovered that that, that that word is because. Uh, I had an equivalent uh, word for for something like volatility, but it was not you know powerful enough to capture it, uh, and it was called long volatility or love volatility, but but didn't quite capture the idea. No, it doesn't. And then one day I read this book by uh, a great book by Guy Deutscher on language, and and he uh, reports in a book something that was discovered by the, by the UK Prime Minister. Gladstone, and, and that was that was you know to the shock of everyone uh, about 100 and some years ago, 140 years ago, that the Greeks did not have a word for blue, like the color of the sky. They exactly. did not have the a color word for the, blue. The, the wine dark, uh, the wine or <laughs> the wine dark uh, sea, you know. Right. So in Homer, Homer, they, they did not have a word for blue. Can you believe it? So they didn't have the full uh, uh, spectrum of, of colors. And these developed much later, and even, of course, uh, ancient Mediterraneans, uh, Greeks, the Hebrews, the uh, Semites, Phoenicians, they don't have a word for blue, so, uh, or for many uh, similar words. And, and it was, but they were not colorblind. They were biologically okay. They were just culturally colorblind. So I realized that sometimes you just beam light on something, by coining a word, and that word <laughs> turned out to be anti-fragility. And, and, and once I, I wrote it down, I realized, <laughs> I started seeing it in places I never suspected 
um, you know, were uh, at this property. Right. And so give, give us some examples of things that are anti-fragile. We understand what fragile – things that are fragile. We understand, well, uh, the, the, actually, I'm even going to go beyond. Half the book is about things that are uh, – love uh, volatility, love harm, love stressors, love things uh, like disorder, love uncertainty, but are harmed because you don't have enough of it, namely political life. But we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Your, your human body, the bones. The bones need stressors, constant stress. They communicate with the environment with stress. So, you uh, you know, if you go and spend a Christmas vacation in a space shuttle, you'll come back with diminished uh, bone density. Which is weird because you'd think it'd be great to be in the space shuttle because your bones will get to rest. What could be better than getting them uh, unstressed? But I mean, yeah, and actually, there's even because we're a complex system, uh, I discovered a, a paper that really changed my thinking by uh, a fellow called Carcenti, 2003 paper in Nature. And of course, he had a lot of follow-up since. And in it, he shows uh, that actually it's not uh, the aging that, that causes uh, weakness in the bones, but the reverse. But I mean, the reverse is equally true. In other words, you have a complex system with feedback loops that are not as obvious as in a linear, uh, ordinary system. And therefore, the idea is that that Weak bone mass makes you older. And, and vice versa. Weaker and older. Exactly. Right? And, and this is how you can see the bone density of, of uh, uh, the females in African and Indian villages who carry jugs of water on their head between 100 and 200 pounds. They have excellent posture and excellent health. And even uh, male uh, 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 reproductive abilities are impacted by, by, by bone density. Well, as a, Which means that if you go to the gym, you're wasting your time because you need weight-bearing uh, stress, not just uh, these uh, uh, tailorist machines that waste your time. Yeah, well, well, maybe we'll have we'll go into that in more detail yeah. later. It, it, you bring it up in the book, and it's a very um, it's a very interesting idea that certain types of what we think are good for our body, exercise and weightlifting, actually are not. We've talked a little bit about it with Art Devaney, who I know you're a fan of. Yeah, it's, uh, art, art gave me a lot of ideas, and, and then suddenly everything flashed together when I had this uh, made the distinction between two types of system: the organic and the non-organic. The organic has a property that the difference between the living and the dead, uh, the living and, 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 and the non-living, the living, uh, the, the between living and the machine, for example, uh, requires stressors. That's how the living, the complex system, communicate with their environment. You need a stressor, like uh, uh, the, the, just as, as with the bones, as with your muscles, as with a lot of things, and, and usually overcompensate for the stressors. There's a mechanism in biology called hormesis. And, but uh, you see, so uh, this table I have in front of me will never get better if I bang on it. Yeah. So it says you use it and lose it. On the other hand, the human body gets better <laughs> if it's exposed to the right amount of stressors. I mean, of course, you have to define the type of stressor and the quantity of stress. But, but, the, uh, the, the, but then that makes a difference between, between two worlds, the organic and, 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 and the engineered. And, and now, if you can apply that to economic life, is economic life in the first or second category? Right. You see, if it's in the first category, then we should have bailouts, top-down engineers, everything. Uh, if it's in the second category, then sorry, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't work that way. Well, you use a metaphor that I've also used myself, which I find uh, deeply um, provocative and, and educational, which is the forest fire. So if, if the goal of, of fire policy is to have no fires and you're constantly putting out every fire as quickly as you can, which is to me what the bailout policy of the last 30 years has been about, it's true that in the short run it looks great because there are no fires. There's no damage. Everybody's fine. It turns out OK. And people even brag, oh, we didn't even have any out of pocket. All we did was guarantee these loans. We didn't even have to pay anything because the guarantee never was invoked. But the problem is is that the brush starts to build up in the natural case. And then when the fire does come, it's the fire of all fires and it is, it is incredibly destructive. Exactly. So what you're doing is you're, you're not lowering volatility. You're increasing fat tails. Yes, so which means that, that most of the contribution to the damage will come from, from a small number of events or, or one single event. Well, it's the same thing in economic life with Greenspan or it's the same thing with human body. If you put someone in a germ-free environment, 
for 15 years than invite him to take a ride on New York subway at rush hour. Yeah. I think he will last a few minutes. Right. And, and the, the, the Greenspan example is, uh, you know, you're fine tuning and steering and you're averting every possible bad event. And then suddenly there comes a bad event you can't overcome anymore. And exactly. Because we have something I, 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 I noticed in 97 uh, with barrier options. <laughs> I realized that uh, if you take, uh, you take variations, all right? When you spend a long time without a variation, you have a lot of exposure built that would be harmed by it. And it's linear with time. So if you spend six months without a new low, for example, and you make a new low, you have a lot more blow-ups. Mm-hmm. You see? So, 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 so quiet uh, periods aren't very healthy for, um, I mean, for financial markets. And, and I noticed it in dynamic hedging by showing the number of, uh, that how a number of uh, barrier options start building up below the lows. It's, it was a metaphor that I kept in my mind for 15 years, and here it popped up. Um, with with when I started talking about the economy and how how managing you know now, the economy causes it to get weaker, but but let me let me now make a, uh, make one statement about about uh, anti fragility. Yeah, go ahead. That, that's quite important. Is what benefit from and following the the, uh, the following uh, phenomena, right? Uh, volatility, stress, uncertainty, error, chaos, variation. Uh, time, because time is volatility and things like that. Now, these categories I ju- have just enumerated are qualitatively and theoretically different. <laughs> volatility and stress are different things. Yeah. Okay. But the phenomenology is the same. Mm-hmm. You see, and, yeah. and that's what is what is quite central for the book. I have to explain that something that gains from volatility tends to gain from stress, and yeah. something that gains from uh, 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 volatility gains from time. And uh, so, so, so this is quite central in the book. I had to explain it early on. Now, this kind of yes. this kind of analogy can be very dangerous. Uh, there's a temptation to say, uh, I'm, "I've fallen prey to this temptation myself." I think it's true, but it, it is a little bit risky. Temptation to say, "Well, this works in nature, uh, and because economic systems are organic, then the same phenomenon is happening here." The question is, is that really true? And what are the underlying causes of that? And I think what you get at that's so interesting is really the fundamental nonlinearities in these organic, unconstructed, unengineered, emergent systems. And that is why – I mean the, the, right way, the way I think about it is – I mean there's no reason that the Federal Reserve policy should really be like fire policy. It's interesting that it could be. It's amazing that it could be the same phenomenon. The question is, is it? And I think the reason it is – gets at the nonlinearities you talk about, which is that if I have a bad event happen 10 times, it's not the same as a 10 times worse single event. That that massive large event, because the damage is not linear, uh, the, the, the effects of the damage are – they get dramatically worse as the size of the damage occurs. And you, you talk about this in many different ways in the book. You talk about it mathematically in terms of convexity and concavity. But the simple way I think that I understood it is that if you have a bunch of little financial errors, even though they could add up to a rel- relatively large number, they're not very harmful. But one financial error that's equal to all those by itself can be unbelievably harmful in terms of the systemic effects. So this is, seems to me to be the essence of what's going on in these organic systems. Yeah, definitely. Whenever you have nonlinearities, then you have uh... – a certain effect, and, and it so happened that effect translates automatically into either fragility or anti-fragility. Nonlinearity implies one or the other, and uh, and actually uh, even used uh, the, this this idea to detect risks in um, in uh, tail uh, risks of tail events and uh, the, the stress test thing. That's now uh, you know we're we're I'm writing an IMS uh, staff paper on it, collaborating with them on, on a method to detect tail risk. Uh, by seeing if you have nonlinearity of exposure, is for example, uh, <clears throat> you know these stress tests that we do, they're, they're nice, they work sometimes, uh, most times they don't. Why? Because the number you have to come up with uh, for a stress test is arbitrary. Why are we stress testing 10%, not 11%? So if someone has nonlinear exposures, and you stress test them uh, at 10%, <clears throat> and and he passes a test 
as many uh, European banks just, uh, did right before the last route. Uh, but 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 then if you test them at 11 percent or 12 percent and see the risk increasing, then you realize that you have a huge exposure to model error from that nonlinearity. Yeah. Now that one that that this this uh, phenomenology is identical to the one uh, uh, of uh, that allows me to detect physical fragility. And let me give you the idea. You take uh, you 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 take a car, <laughs> you drive it against the wall at a, a tenth of a mile per hour, a hundred times or, or a thousand times. Are you going to be harmed? No. A tenth of a mile per hour doesn't won't harm you. The, the car would have some damage, but not you. Now, drive the same car once at a hundred miles per hour. Okay. okay. You're dead. Okay. So that's <laughs> the, so so the the definition of fragility, universal definition of physical. Uh, epistemic fragility, <laughs> model fragility, everything has to have some nonlinear term, and or, or, or like uh, what we'd call short gamma in in, in 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 option trading, and and it's 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 quite universal. This coffee cup I have on my desk now has uh, you know suffered a lot of shocks, <laughs> zero material fatigue because below the threshold. But uh, I, 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 I mean, I'm, uh, you can't see me do it, but if I uh, uh, let it uh, fall to the floor, it will break, it will shatter. And it's a shock uh, that that it gets uh, cumulatively every few hours. You see, on right on the table. So it is not. So we, what you have is, if you are harmed increasingly. In other words, if you if you're if ten percent harms you uh, uh, more than disproportionately more than nine percent, and eleven percent disproportionately more than ten percent, you have accelerated harm. Then you're fragile. And vice versa, if you're anti-fragile. So let's let's talk about the anti-fragile side because that's the less intuitive side. Yes, we all, we understand this idea that you know if I if I if I bump a coffee cup a little bit against the side of the table, I can do that a thousand times, and I haven't really there's no damage, but but the cumulative effect of, a, of one excuse me, but but one lo- there might be no cumulative effect even it could be relatively harmless, but one large shock like dropping it three feet rather than uh, an an inch. Uh, 36 times is totally different. It's just of a different – it's not just, oh, it's a little worse. It's it's over. It's dead. Now, how does that work on the anti-fragile side? The argument has to be, to carry it over, that the bumping is – it gets stronger and stronger and stronger so that, in fact, the bigger the, the bump, the better and le- as long as I stay below some threshold. Exactly. And, and of course, not in the anti flips and sign, uh, the second derivative flips and sign at some point. But uh, uh, the, 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 let me give a very simple example. You go to the gym, okay? What's better over a week to lift uh, uh, a tenth of a pound a thousand times right. or lift a uh, uh, hundred uh, pounds once? And so that's, okay, so that's, that's my it, body. That's your body. I mean, of course, you, there's some nuances. You have uh, three kind of fibers. You have fast twitch fiber, and these are very, very anti-fragile. Fast twitch uh, fibers in your system require uh, require the extremes. In other words, uh, the, the, it's even more pronounced. <laughs> but you have the low twitch fibers that may benefit from, say, uh, an earlier. Uh, it, it has some convexity that stops very early. Now, so there's a chapter in the book on health, which as listeners know, I'm very interested in recently as I've started to eat differently and and work out uh, in in a rigorous way. But it's much more important than just about your health. Um, There's a a huge part of the book is about both career advice and about uh, policy advice. So let's talk a little bit about career advice. You point out it's a rather – it's a provocative idea that – the tails are very different from the middle. It's again essentially a nonlinearity. So yes. a person who's working at a at a minimum wage job, you argue, in a certain dimension, is is very anti fragile. And a person who's got a nice steady job at say the bank, who's a clerk, is very fragile. And, and yet that's not our common sense. So what, talk about those differences. Yeah. Okay. The, the 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 there's something I call the barbell and the black swan, where I showed that a portfolio that has, say, 90% in treasury bills and 10% in extremely risky securities, it was more robust because uh, your measure of volatility uh, won't, I mean, provided, of course, adjusted for inflation or if you have inflation-linked uh, securities for 90%, anyway, it will be a lot more robust because it doesn't depend on computation, uh, on, it doesn't have model error, okay? It was very risky, you know it's very risky, so that's a lot more robust than a regular portfolio. 
Likewise, if you walk, and that's a Devaney idea, <laughs> if you walk and sprint, it's vastly better for your health than jogging. Right. You see? Uh, and then I continue, uh, the, the, if you want, uh, a company, a corporation should have a certain amount of, uh, you know, if it's energy uh, in, in a very con- a thing that makes money, all right, but should have dual strategy of, of very safe and then very speculative. Uh, just like, you know, um, uh, birds, monogamous birds, well, you know that the strategy in the, in the female kingdom, even on the monogamy, is you have the accountant, and 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 once in a while you have a uh, you get pregnant with a rock star. Yeah. Okay, so th- that's a barbell strategy. You see, <laughs> another barbell strategy. I noticed that the great writers did not work as journalists. Yeah, I love they that. had a cushy job. They had a barbell, and then when they wrote, it was very speculative literature. Uh, like Kafka had a well, I mean, he had a, uh, he didn't have a job as a journalist. He didn't write during the day. You see, it's not like uh, you know he he was a journalist. So that's very common in in the French uh, uh, in French literature. Whether when their parents were rich, they become diplomats. When the parents are poor, they become postal workers. You see, and you write on the side rather than uh, have that middle. Uh, Einstein was a patent clerk, okay, and then did his theories at night. I think so Faulkner, instead of being an academic, sorry? Yeah, Faulkner worked in a, a boiler room somewhere when he was writing his best books. But why is that relevant? Why is it bad to work as a journalist? That seems okay. Why in the middle, I mean, I'm saying that like some things in the middle sometimes, uh, there's some I can explain, some I can't explain, <laughs> you see. Uh, but, but when I go to a restaurant, uh, I'd like to have uh, my steak and salad uh, first, and then the dessert later. I don't want them to uh, mix uh, the steak with the salad and the dessert and bring them to me at once, you see? Sure. So you want a certain separation of function and separation of things. Um, in, in a lot of domains, it confers some robustness on grounds uh, that to get anti-fragility, first of all, you have to remove fragility. It's not symmetric. Anti-fragile is what has the right tail. Fragile is what has a left tail, but the, uh, the, 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 the anti-fragile requires no left tail. Yeah. You see, in other words, you have to clip your left tail. You have to have some margin of safety and then take, uh, be very speculative to be exposed to volatility, be long volatility. And underlying sure. that idea, which is very beautiful in the book, is this idea of an, of an option where you can – the downside comes, but you're not subject to it. You can refuse it, and then you can embrace the upside. Exactly, and and I made a spec, and then I took it into epistemological grounds by saying, okay, in finance, you may say that people you pay for the option because nobody's going to give it to you for free, and and typically, very often, options are highly overpriced because people are scared of them when they label as options. But in real life, people don't notice the options. <laughs> you see, and it's not just real option; optionality is uh, situations. And and I took it into the epistemological uh, ground by showing how if trial and error is an irrational option. In a sense, you keep what you like, and nature actually uh, uh, tinkers, and 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 uh, we 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 discovered uh, only I mean only 40 years ago, 50 years 40 years ago with uh, Monod and Jacob that, uh, uh, that nature knows it can make the perfect baby, so it tinkers. You have spontaneous abortions 50 percent of the time right. without anyone knowing about it. You see. So the so the trial and error is 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 embedded in 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 my idea of a convex uh, uh, economy. Yeah, most mutations uh, most mutations are not productive, and they get weeded out. They don't get they don't get to reproduce. They just they're they're failures, and they're just thrown out. That's exactly. And nature nature actually there's what I call that there's a fractal layers of anti fragilities, and and uh, and there's a gentleman who read my draft, and Antoine Danchin, who's a, a you know top notch. Um, a physicist turned a geneticist, and and he uh, uncovered the mechanism within your cells that that causes premature age. Why premature aging comes from not stressing your your system, and 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 because there's competition between molecules in your system. So what you have is evolution is an anti-fragile process. It likes some volatility, otherwise you don't have selection bias. The selection, okay? Right. Likewise, in your body, okay, you have competing things, and you want to always accelerate the weakness of the weak in order to get the, 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 the to, to get rejuvenation of cells. Mm-hmm. So, and then there's a mechanism called hormesis, and, and that was known by the ancients. 
if you give someone a little bit of poison, he becomes immune. It's called misrealization. Misre- I don't know how to pronounce it. Misrealization, all right. Uh, was a king who who became immune to poison that way, but there's a, but but they noticed also that it went beyond that you got actually stronger with a very small uh, doses of exposure. It's not um, you know uh, what you think. It's definitely not uh, homeopathy. It is actually uh, it's something that has been tested in a lot of domains. A little bit of radiation been, it's universally, uh, protects you from skin cancer. Sorry? Yeah, it's universally observed in science. It's very difficult to find a counterexample. You know, the, day, the expression in everyday life is the dose makes the poison, meaning at a small dose, it's good for you. With a large dose, it could kill you or will kill you. And we that, see it true. constantly. We see it, you know, the, the discoveries about the benefits of alcohol. Obviously, in small doses, it appears wine is good for your heart. In large doses, it destroys you. That's true, but you have to be careful with this. That was what Paracelsus, who, you know, uh, was one of the pioneers of uh, homeopathy, uh, discovered. I'm not talking about homeopathy, where it's really a matter of dosage, you see. Well, but it, 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 I'm talking about a real, uh, something that's evidence-based a process by which some amount of uh, exposure causes overreaction on your part. Mm-hmm. You see, and, I, and, and, and actually, when you go to the gym... What you have is an overreaction. Yeah. I lift 100 pounds today. Okay, my body will project that I'm going to have a stressor slightly uh, worse next time. So it prepares for 105 pounds. Yeah. It, provided you have enough recovery. Right. You do it Homeopathy <laughs> is something where you have very small uh, things. I mean, the, 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 say, the saying applies to both, but I would be careful. I don't want my ideas... To, uh, to be used by, by people in homeopathy to justify uh, their methods because their methods have not yet uh, you know, shown <laughs> any the test, scientific yeah. uh, empirical uh, validity. And you're not suggesting you should be drinking, uh, taking a lot of arsenic in your, in your sp- sprinkling arsenic on your food. You're saying that s- uh, the right level of stress at small doses makes you st- – what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, uh, yes, and, and also, uh, but, but, but you have to make sure that uh, uh, that you don't have selection bias as well. For sure. And I, I, I wrote about some illusions we have about things that, that get people stronger. In fact, it's just a selection bias. For example. So, so there, there, there are a lot of things in anti-fragility that are uh, counter counter uh, uh, common wisdom. Right. Well, you, yeah, you talk about how it. Because of selection bias, it looks like it's making you stronger, but just you've weeded out some of the weak ones. It's not exactly, exactly, which is effectively how it works within the cells. Right. You see, it's more of a destructive process within your cell than a strengthening process, and can do the same within populations. You see. So let's talk about via negativa, which is a phrase you use to capture addition by subtraction, and part of this is a reaction to some of the criticism you got from the black swan where people would say, okay, so every once in a while, there's a really bad thing that happens. So how do I predict that really bad thing? <laughs> and, and your insight, which is so profound, is now that the whole point of the black swan is that you can't predict it. So rather than figuring out when it's going to come so you can be ready for it, the best thing is to create an environment where it can't hurt you very much. Exactly. And, and, and shifting to non-predictive uh, methods. I, I, when I started writing this book, I had a, a lot of bitterness in me from, from because people couldn't understand my black swan. Uh, they were buying it. It sold uh, several million copies. Uh, and, 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 and most of the people didn't get it. That, that I'm not talking about uh, the black swan. I'm trying to warn people against um, exposure to prediction errors. And uh, you see, nature is not predictive. <laughs> so the... Uh, uh, and and via negativa is is of course uh, via, I, I realize is what I call negative advice acts of omission, and when people tell me what should I do, I told them well don't get exposed to negative black swan. It's very easy to remove negative black swan from your life. If you're a bank, don't sell tales. Uh, if you're if you're in a business, don't do these things. If you're an individual, don't smoke. Don't uh, don't have. Uh, uh, fructose sugar. Uh, don't uh, hang around the mafia, uh, with members of the mafia, and don't do that. So, so they didn't, didn't understand. They said, "No, I want advice," <laughs> and 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 they couldn't get the point that, uh, uh, which I phrased in a black swan, in a certain way, that the chess player, the the, the rookie, tries to win, uh, the 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 professional uh, tries to make the other person lose, or that, for example, you'd contribute more the negativa by removing things. Then by adding in, but pharma doesn't, of course, uh, does want to hear it. Right, they I say, more lies, if you prevented people from, 
from uh, from smoking, you save more lives than everything done since penicillin cumulatively, right? Mm. So, so and people don't want to hear it. Likewise, you see all these things, these these drugs. People are looking for for the miracle cure or the miracle pill or the, or, or the silver pill or, or anything that to make people live longer. Okay. The philosopher's stones they just don't realize that starvation is the, way, the most effective way, and we have enough evidence of that. We even now have evidence, and, and, and another paper last week, that if you starve people for four months, you reverse diabetes, and they can gain their weight back, and they will still be normal. They will be insulin sensitive, and, and, and you can reverse diabetes really by subtraction, remove food. The ancients knew that. So the via negativa is, I mean, I got a little more aggressive with via negativa by showing that you remove uh, the things. If removing does not have side effects or no long-term side effects, you see. Whereas in a complex system, every time you add something, you have multiplicated side effects. And you can't predict what they are. Is the and you can't predict by the nature of complex system, you see. Uh, uh, so via negativa is not. So uh, removing, uh, people told me, what would you do in this economy? I said, just remove Geithner to start with. Everything would be okay. <laughs> All right? Then we'll have less control by, uh, by the, you know, by, by, by a certain crowd of, uh, <laughs> of what's going on in Wall Street. I mean, removal, removal is much easier, and democracy works by via negativa. The idea is not to find, to have good ruler, but to be able to remove the bad ones. <laughs> well, in the American Constitution, when it was put in place, it was designed to talk about what government can't do and instead it is uh, governments become more concerned with what it can do. Um, you talk in the book very provocatively, I love it, about our bias toward intervention, uh, which is this is all of course a part of. I, I want to know the vitamin pill I should take. I don't want to hear about what I shouldn't be doing. I want to hear what I can do. I want to be, I want to be proactive. We have this incredible uh, psychological bias toward being proactive rather than than act than uh, passive, and I think and it's a um, which again is a nice example of your opposite. The opposite of proactive isn't react isn't uh, isn't passive. It's uh, excuse me. It's people think the opposite of proactive is reactive. It's not. It's doing nothing. It's passive. It's yeah, letting it, things it, happen. It doesn't it mean is, nothing's going to happen. Is it? But it sounds it, terrible. Of course, it's uh, Fabian. <laughs> There's a Fabius Computator who whose big achievement. Is uh, is uh, resisting, uh, you know, and, and making sure Hannibal is, destroys himself before attacking. Mm -hmm. yeah, you see, him, and this is uh, the, the, uh, he's a big general, and he was not a coward. He just said, uh, you know, my asset is time, and, and I want to use it. This ties in a little bit, uh, I, well, to me a lot. I think in the book also, uh, where you talk, you have a very um, uh, a nice diagram. You have a giant cube which is the real world and what we know about it, um, the real world, excuse me. And then you have a little tiny, tiny cube, which is what we know about the real world that is scientifically rigorous, experimental, tested through rigorous techniques. And it's unfortunately, it's a fact that what we understand rigorously is a very small part of what we'd like to understand, but we can't help ourselves. We want to believe that that real world is a lot more understood than it actually is. How do we... How do you explain that? Yeah, this is here. This is where I have the character Fat Tony, okay, who had a lot more. Uh, he didn't have knowledge of the small world, okay, but he had rigor in the large world. And in the end, of what matters is the rigor of the large world. Um, you see, last time we spoke, I was talking uh, about the Christian bed, uh, about uh, you know uh, the, the, the tendency we have to uh, you know. Uh, well, tell the story. Tell about the better procrastinate. Yeah, okay, the better procrastinate. We had there's a, there's a fellow. Uh, uh, had a bed, and, and he would abduct travelers and put them in, uh, feed them, and then put them in his bed. Those who were too tall, he would amputate their legs, and those who were too short, he would stretch them. So, so the, the, the we bed have was a, a perfect fit. A perfect fit, always perfect fit. We have a tendency in in a lot of things to to to, yeah, to, to try to use to put people in a Procrucian bed, and and uh, Fat Tony had the rigor of thinking outside the Procrucian bed, what we say thinking outside the box or something. But that's it, it's non trivial because there are rules outside the box, <laughs> and these rules are uh, 
non, uh, I mean, you can actually catalog them and you can actually change the small world by uh, uh, coming from the large world rather than doing the opposite, the autistic, uh, whatever you want to call it. Analytical, the Analytical scientific. micro, it's like trying to impose logic on, on larger one. So the, the, because logic works, but uh, things are a lot more ambiguous. So uh, via negativa is a central idea, you see. Harnessing anti-fragility, trying to discover things by trial and error, and focusing on payoff, which is uh, non-predictive, rather than focusing on prob- probabilities, which have embedded the predictive uh, 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 thing in it, you see. Probability is predictive, and a uh, uh, predictive aspect to it. So, so we have a... Um, a different, a different paradigm when you work in the large world. And, uh, and of course, we have the invisible, uh, what I call logic, of rules we have inherited from the elders. And typically, just like as you mentioned, the American Constitution, uh, you have the heuristic, what I call the, the ancestral heuristics, what we have inherited from the elders, and typically the negative rules, what not to do. Yeah, I think that's probably almost always true. Yeah, like debt. Debt. I mean, the Babylonians had a interdict against debt. Uh, so were, uh, of course, the the uh, Hebrews. So were uh, the Greek. I mean, the Greeks did not like debt. They didn't have a, a strong interdict. Uh, Aquinas had a fatwa against debt. Neither a Aquinas. borrower nor a lender be. Yeah, exactly. And then you have, of course, and then of course, Islam bans debt. But but uh, but the language used by the uh, by uh, Aquinas in his Summa is vastly stronger than the language used in, uh, in Islam against debt. So so you learn uh, there's no reason you don't have to understand the logic, but there's something in risk management. The largest end you find, you're going to find it either in nature or <laughs> in history. You see. So if you're talking on on for uh, on statistical grounds, big it's samples. a much more ecological uh, uh, test and with a very large end. Yeah, big sample. Um, and yet we always think, well, we just need to manage it. Debt is bad, of course, but I don't need to worry about it because I know how to I've, – I've got a theory. I've got a model. I, uh, I can make it work. Yeah, but I've used the very same convexity effects, okay, right. both to show why uh, you need stochastic feeding – uh, why, of course, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the hormesis, what we call, you know, what, what you were calling harm, uh, I mean, benefits of small doses of something otherwise harmful, and all the, the other things, there's the same convexity effect. Size and debt and special, over-specialization fragilize and, and leverage, they fragilize. Yeah. You see, a redundancy uh, uh, makes you robust. And eventually, it's, it's actually uh, necessary even to become anti before becoming anti fragile is to have large redundancies. It may seem strange, <laughs> uh, non optimal, but uh, but we have inherited, as I said last time, we have two lungs and two kidneys. An economist has never designed a human being with two lungs <laughs> and two kidneys. It's wasteful. It's dead yeah, weight it's waste, loss. Exactly. So the opposite of uh, spare parts would be that. Yeah. And, and nature doesn't like that. Nature likes redundancies. And actually, this mechanism of overreaction is redundancy. And, and let me give you um, a little hint here. Uh, when you take a trader or a risk manager at a bank, they look at the past for the worst-case scenario. Okay? And, and actually, you know, making a mistake of, of, of not uh, recursing. Uh, they say, well, the worst day was uh, 22% in the stock market, so let's use 22%. The human body doesn't do that. Right. The human body doesn't say, think that the worst harm is, uh, is, uh, is going to be the next worst harm. The human body builds a margin on top of that. Yep. It thinks, ah, the worst day was 22% in the market. Your human body would say, okay, let's calibrate and adjust and, 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 and manage for 27%. Or 50. Okay? Or 50. If we can. Sorry? Or 50%. Whatever. I mean, not that much. It's just like what, if I lift 100 pounds, my body will start coding, you see, for, for an ability to, to be able to uh, lift 105 pounds. I mean, and then if you lift 105 pounds, then, then it will code again for a little more. There are limits, of course, of, of, of you know, structural limits, but they will go to, to these limits. But the other side of this, which again is just incredibly... Um Fascinating. It helps you see the way the world is working these days is that 
in today's world, because of policy we've imposed already, we allow fragile people to impose their – they become anti-fragile and they push their fragility onto others. So you have many examples of this in the book. Talk about some of those and what that means. Yeah, well, I, I, I went into ethics in the last section of the book and, and uh, what I call book five. Because actually, I was starting, you know, I discovered at some point that I had a lot of books in the book. So, so I, I call them book one through book five. Um, because they're separate, uh, separate topics after the first uh, uh, section in which I present anti-fragility. And the last one is, uh, I call it skin in the game. Uh, I mean, the ethics of anti-fragility. What happens is that some people in society have the option, namely the bankers, the managers of businesses, okay, uh, is, is in the left, left column, they have other people's skin in, in their game. No skin in the game. Uh, they, they keep the upside and transfer the downside to others. Yeah. And you can see it easily. Managers of companies, the stock market has lost about $5 trillion over the past uh, 10 years, comparatively, you know, because a lot of stocks were issued at a higher level compared to cost of funds. Say $5 trillion is a ballpark figure. Uh, managers of uh, companies made $400 billion. Why? Because they have the upside, no downside. So they actually own the option and they benefit from volatility. So, uh, so no skin in the game. In that category, I put bureaucrats, journalists, uh, corporate executives, um, journal, I mean, bankers, of course, and other people I call fragilistas. Okay. Now, people with skin in the game are citizens people who have the upside and downside of their actions. They don't pay their mortgage, they lose their house. <laughs> they, exactly, or, or people, yeah, they, I mean, I'm, if I make a mistake, uh, then, then you have skin in the game. And of course, my rule of ethic is whatever I write about is to have a corresponding position in the market. So I don't really care about, about being perceived right or wrong. What matters is the payoff. Anyway, so this is the middle column, is people with skin in the game. And of course, the right column is an interesting column of people who actually don't have upside. You see, they, 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 they're there to take the downside of others. And they have the highest status in society. Traditionally, they've had the highest status in society. Just compare a banker who has upside and no downside because they don't have negative bonuses, okay, to someone in the military. He has his life, he doesn't have a bonus, and, and he has his life online, you see? Yeah, so, that's a very, it's a very beautiful insight, right? It, it's exactly. basically that um, the people, yeah, the honor, honor is bestowed on those who, who take the bullet for others. Exactly. People who, just like I gave example, it, it can be in any, uh, you don't have to be a saint, uh, a, a knight, a warrior, a soldier, uh, um, or a prophet, or a, a pre-modern, a philosopher in a pre-modern sense, okay, or, or a maverick. You, you can be just uh, like, like that uh, a babysitter who uh, pushed herself, okay, uh, and, and lost her life because she wanted to protect, she had responsibility for the baby, okay, she was, she was holding you see? And you argue that modernity is pushing more and more people into the left column, the fragilistas who impose their downside on others, and we don't spend as much time on that right column. Exactly. Our, culture, and, and, our culture doesn't do that. In fact, we look at those people sometimes as fools. Oh, they could have, they could have avoided that harm, and yet they, they, they're idiots. Exactly. And, and in fact, it's the first time we had power without, for people who uh, don't have courage. It's the first time in, in, in history – in which the people on top had power without courage, first time. You cannot find it in any society. Take the knights. The knights were people who, of course, the, the, the reason, the, the, their, their trade was that they, would, uh, they were risking their lives. This is why they were, you know, uh, or lords were supposed to, or, to, to die first, okay? And, and, of course, the president of, of the United States was, was, you know, supposed to be first in battle, you see? Not someone pushing a button, Okay. Changes the uh, so the 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 and and the only way you can have a state society is by moving the third the first column the left column, moving these people out of there, making them more accountable. Yeah, it's hard to get there though. We've, we've... You can with a legal system. You can in various ways. You can, but but I say I think society will explode because then you start having a growing wedge between what is ethical and what's legal. 
and I have I've named names in here. Yes, you do. I don't know if you want to name them, but I am I'm, I'm ready to take your a, choice. a lawsuit. Your, but uh, it's, your, it's your book. <laughs> no, no, I've named, I've named people who, who, who to me, you, you could, for example, some academics uh, can cherry pick. Uh, they can give uh, contradictory advice and retain the one because they don't have skin in the game. They don't go bankrupt from from the bad trade, uh, so to speak. They 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 were always going to be there. You see. Uh, the problem with the Nobel Prize in economics. You, 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 people are not penalized for being wrong. They're not penalized. The, 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 you, can't, you cannot have a, a proper functioning. I just uh, wrote a paper in a policy journal in which I, 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 I show that uh, without accountability, okay, risks will keep growing because people will hide them. And, and, and we had a system in ancient societies for that. And that's Hammurabi's law. And Hammurabi understood risk very well. And it was as follows. If the, archi- if the house collapses and kills the owner of the house, the architect is put to death. Why? Not because to punish people. It's as a deterrent because sure. no inspector, no regulator, nobody will ever know more about what's in a foundation than the architect himself. Yeah. You see? So you can hide risks from society. You can cherry pick. You can do a lot of things unless you have a direct responsibility for the results of your action. Yeah, it's... it's um, and uh, when I put it in the a, in a New York Times, uh, you know, it seemed, it seemed too simplistic. I, I put that, that proposal in the New York Times by saying, you know, that capitalism is not about incentives. It's about disincentives. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Uh, people said, well, it would be too easy. Can you implement it? But of course, society can only survive when we... When everything is based on very simple heuristics, not 28 page, 100 page documents. No appendices with lots of Greek letters. No. That's a deep idea because it really gets at this interface between what I would call effectiveness and ethics. And I, and I had a conversation this past week with someone. I was suggesting that the Federal Reserve, that the chair of the Federal Reserve over the last 15 years has encouraged imprudence has honored and rewarded malfeasance, has insulated people from recklessness relentlessly, and that maybe there was some bad incentive problems with the way the Fed was structured. And And her reaction was, I don't like to think that about the chair of the Fed. I think they're trying the best they can. Well, there's no sense. You well, cannot, no society has ever put someone in a position of responsibility without accountability well, on the outside. I said that's nice. It could be true. But yeah, when has there ever been a person who had that much power who didn't succumb to the dark side of it? it it's nice that there might be such a person, but I don't know them. I, they don't ex- – like you say, they don't really exist in history. And, and so the, the counter argument is, oh, but their reputation – you know the reputation will will insulate them from will, will protect us from their malfeasance. But the problem is, it's very hard to evaluate. It's, it's true. But you don't see the link between action and consequence. So when I talk about fragility, and 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 uh, the, you know, the, the, in, in my central chapter, uh, chapter five, on political systems, uh, I, I talk about small uh, the the local. I mean localism. About yeah. The, talk why, about why Switzerland. Small, talk sorry? about Swiss, Talk about Switzerland. Yeah, I mean, Switzerland doesn't have, I mean, people think that Switzerland uh, has, a, Switzerland doesn't have a government. It has a, or, or if it has a very centralized government, at the very local level, you see, it's a collection of municipalities, and the noise washes up. Okay, so it's not that their political system is remarkably intelligent, it's just that it's small. So the mistakes are made small, and things aggregate up without the mistakes, you see. The, the other element in it, Concerning ethics, that if you uh, um, make a mistake in forecasting, you make a mistake, any kind of mistake, it's not like Alan Greenspan, who's never going to run into you or, or other victims. You encounter these people Sunday yeah. at 10 o'clock at church, <laughs> you see? So you have this biological skin in the game yeah. that doesn't uh, exist, uh, uh, you know, when you... Uh, in Brussels, for example, where, where you can have this loss of ethics at the level of lobbyists. Shame. Shame plays a role in everyday life. Exactly. It can't exactly. play a role if the only people you see are the people you're helping. <laughs> exactly. This is why on my column to the right, I have the artisan, the artisan, someone, and the last artisan we had, the last great artisan was Steve Jobs. Yeah. Where people have their ego in the game, yeah, you see. That's right. It is, it is they have their the product, you know. Uh, you know, Steve Jobs had his 
the inside the, the computer, he was just like cabinet makers. Unlike, uh, you know, these commercial uh, shelves you buy, they look great on the outside and ugly on the inside mm -hmm. because, no, you know, it's not meant to be displayed. Their inside is not meant to uh, to uh, to be seen. It's the same thing with uh, the, uh, Steve Jobs <laughs> had the inside of the computers look good, although you can't open them. So, Which is kind of crazy. It is no, well, that's an artisan. It means he's not in the game for anything except to deliver authenticity. You see that with artisans. You see, you will see that with politicians at a local level. This is why one of the great arguments. Now, Sweden, you think, has 60-some percent of the GDP, okay, in government. It's not the same as the United States because the bulk of the money is spent locally. Makes a big difference. A huge difference. I'm not sure that's the only difference, but uh, between it is a huge, the, the, a huge difference. Size has uh, a lot of effects. I mean, I, I use the same argument. I mean, the size is visible everywhere. Uh, forecasting errors uh, are uh, grow with size. See, I have a very sinister theory of 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 the size bias, which is, you know, you point out Switzerland works very well. That small mistakes are relatively harmless. They just stay small. They don't aggregate up. And then you look at the euro, you look at the European Union, right? And you think, well, it's obvious that the European Union is not going to work well. It's too many people. There's the accountability and the feedback loops aren't there. And yet the people who want to run the European Union are going to tell you it's so more – it's more efficient. Well, of course it is if it could be run by God. But when it's run by human beings, it doesn't work that way. Exactly. I mean they, they themselves have this um, a certain principle, this subsidiarity principle, is that any problem should be dealt with at the lowest possible level. You see, it, it, it things only uh, necessary things should go up to Brussels. But given that you have a lot of diplomats and, uh, or sorry, bureaucrats in Brussels, these people uh, make uh, you know their job look. Uh, I mean, of course, they're going to create uh, create uh, jobs for themselves, and and and, and you know, it's metastatic Bureauc bureaucracies have always been metastatic since ancient. That's what destroyed ancient Egypt, by the way. The first nation centralized nation state. <laughs> And the metastatic bureaucracy. Yeah, it doesn't. They don't work very well. Let me ask you something. And this is. I'm going to take a. I'm going to take a shot at you, and yeah. then, then I'm going to defend you. And I want maybe your defense is different, but this is the way I defend your ideas. Some people have have said about your work. This is this is a. I would consider this book a, a sort of the third book in a trilogy. It starts with fooled by randomness. It goes to the black swan, and it goes to this one. And some people say about your first two books, they'll. They may say it about this one too, but it doesn't really matter. They say, oh, there's nothing new in there. We knew it already. We knew that there's risk. We knew there's tales. Oh, this is uncertainty. People understand that probability is hard to, to assess, that we get fooled. And I have a very different take on your work. And basically I see it as it's all the same book. And I view that as a plus, not a minus. And the reason I do is that every, there's nothing new under the sun to take a very old insight. What's new is how we think about them, and it gets at your distinction between the inventor and the implementer. It's you know people people love the inventor; they don't they don't give much honor to the implementer. But the, the real issue is is insight isn't worth anything unless you absorb it. So if I tell you you know don't put all your eggs in one basket, and you write it down, okay, don't put all my eggs in one basket. But if it doesn't get in your bones, it's not going to change your life. And the uh, power yeah, but, of your ideas is that they get in your bones the way you write, the use of metaphor, the use of humor, I see, the use that, of characters. And you go deeper and deeper into these ideas, and they're very deep. No, both your criticism and your answer confirm one thing, all right, to me, is that what I'm saying is not wrong. Yeah, that's a good – that's a now, plus. That's exactly. <laughs> somewhat, the, the, the point is that when people tell me what you're saying uh, is not new, all right, and they find uh, 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 – Conflicting predecessors. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it makes me it makes me smile because effectively what I'm saying is exactly opposite of what they consider was not new. And let me uh, let me explain. Yeah. Uh, traditionally, we have put the most trust in small probabilities and the most risk in small probabilities. And I'm trying to stand this argument completely on its head: is that this is where we we don't understand anything. And it was never written before that small probabilities are completely incomputable, you see, in proportion to 
they're, they're, they're how small they are in inverse proportion to to uh, to p the, the the probability itself, and this is what people are not getting. But the fact that they're saying that it's not new means that they're agreeing with me. <laughs> you see, right? No, so what I'm proposing here is a, is a system. And it took me a long time to develop it. Because I know I'm saying the same thing. I hope I'm saying the same thing because I'm not, uh, as I said in, in the introduction, I'm not writing uh, uh, close-ended books, you know, on, on closed topic with an expiration date. I'm going deeper and deeper into the central element of daily life or, or of life, okay? What do you do when you don't know what's going on? Okay. That's, that's, that's the a great biggest, way to the describe most important it. question yeah. to, uh, we face. <laughs> What do we do? A government, an individual, a corporation, a dentist, anything. What do you do when you don't know what's going on? This is the most important question that I am obsessed with, okay? I'm trying to answer it. Now, the fact that the best compliment I can hear, I ever hear when someone tells me it's not new because I know it has not been written elsewhere, <laughs> you see, or maybe some portions of the derivation where it exists elsewhere. But this notion that the smaller the probability, the less we know what's going on, and 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 it, you know is exactly in reverse of uh, the common understanding of such a problem. And that's because because I would I would have thought because convexity effects because small probability is very convex to error. You see, meaning the consequences are so different. No, no, no. It's the probability itself. Okay, take the Gaussian distribution. Okay, and Which actually, in, in a separate paper, I finally proved something that 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 stayed, stayed with me for years. Take a very thin-tailed distribution, such as the Gaussian. Thin-tailed, yeah. Thin-tailed. Okay, it's a normal a distribution. Standard one. Okay, you have uh, uh, two inputs, one of which is standard deviation. No, standard deviation is pretty much your error. Okay. Right. Now, if you take a remote event, say uh, six, seven, eight sigmas. Okay, you increase uh, uh, you know so some standard deviation away from the mean. You increase the sigma by ten percent. The the probability of that is multiplied by several thousand, several million, several billion, several uh, uh, you know billion billions, right? Several trillions. Okay. Okay. So what you have with with uh, you have nonlinearity to of of remote events to sigma. So the standard deviation of the distribution. Yes. And that, in fact, if you have uncertainty about the smallest uncertainty you have in, your, in, your, in, 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 in the estimation of the standard deviation, the higher the small probability becomes. And at the same time, the bigger the mistake you're going to have about the small probability. So in other words, the, most of the uncertainty in, in parameterizing a model goes to the tails. So you take an event like Fukushima, you see, where they said, well, it should happen every million years. Yeah. You perturbate probabilities a little bit, and the one in a million becomes one in 30. Yeah. Or the financial crisis. Or, yeah. or anything. So what I meant is you can, you can take, so what, what I uh, managed to derive is the following. If anything, any small probability, all right, is, is derived with an error rate, you agree? You have an error rate because only God doesn't have an error rate. Yeah. But then God doesn't have probabilities, all right? Yep. You have an error rate. And if you, that error rate has an error rate, okay? Yeah. And, and if this in turn has an error rate, and you continue, yeah. then you end up with power laws. Depends on the regime, of course. Depends on how big the error of the error of the error is going to be. See? With a, and a power law is a very fat tail. A very fat tail. And, of course, how to parameterize. And, and that, was, that was how, I mean, I, I, you know, you can, you can derive uh, power law tails just from counterfactuals. But what is central here, what I'm saying that is central in my work, is that you can have certainties. You can, you're not gonna, never going to get in tr big trouble in the body of the distribution. What you're likely to get in trouble is in the tails. True. And the benefits of being right in the tails are very small. Okay. If, if a small imprecision multiplies the probability of a 10 sigma event by several trillion, you, you know you shouldn't be talking about 10 sigma events. But I want to come back to the way you, you formulated a minute ago because I think it's it's very deep and it's very important. You said, what do you do when you don't know what's going on? 
and I, and I would add, which I think comes right out of your book, and most of the time, you don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not like this is a special case. Uh, I think about it a lot with economic policy because when I suggest that maybe we should do nothing or the government should get small or we should reduce debt across the board – People say, how, you know, how can you do that? You, you're going to hurt you. How can you see? You've got to have some positive. The reason, say, Hayek doesn't matter. I don't think it's a fair criticism of Hayek. But people say, well, he, would, he didn't want to do anything. And my one counter is, but you don't know what you're doing. You have no idea what you're doing. And you claim you have a scientific basis I, I, for it. I see. I'm bringing in some more solutions here based on this convexity effect. Okay? It's not all pessimistic. I know, for example, from convexity effects, okay, that uh, I pretty much can 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 map uh, the extent of the unpredictability. Uh, let me give an example. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, typically, you know, a big convexity effect uh, or fragility, the negative convexity effect, is in traffic. Yeah. You put eighty thousand cars on the streets. You have no traffic. You move ninety thousand. Now traffic time goes up ten percent. Ninety thousand cars. Okay. You go to 100,000 cars, and traffic time doubles. Yeah. Exactly. So, so and those are those little now, perturbations you... that each person struggling to keep up with the person in front of them, and that slows the person behind them down, and congestion is very nonlinear. Okay, so we have, we have an idea. You can apply the same to the size of corporations. You can, nature applies it to the size of animals. Anything bigger than an elephant is speculative because uh, there's negative convexity effects. You can pretty much, uh, uh, you know, you can use it for speed. You know, it's the same thing with speed. Driving, we actually do it. We limit speed to 55 uh, miles per hour uh, because accidents at 55 miles per hour aren't, you know, a tenth as dangerous as accidents that take place at 100 miles per hour. Yeah. You see, so we, we, we can do things. We can do things using this concept of convexity effect. In other areas, okay, and, and how much redundancies do you need? How many mean deviations do you need to be away from your uh, accelerated harm? Heathrow, for example, those who built Heathrow Airport, okay, didn't realize that the smallest perturbation causes uh, four, five, six-hour delays. Yeah. Backlog, which means that you have to reduce it by a certain amount. And actually, I've been talking a lot to the Cameron administration to start using these methods to, uh, uh, to control size. So the the analog in the financial system would be limiting – or would you favor limiting the size of banks or limiting the size of leverage or both or neither? Uh, I mean I don't know if we can limit uh, if society. You know, what happens is that size – companies destroy themselves automatically with size. Unless we, we could, unless we save them. And exactly. <laughs> so we should not save them. I agree. And we should have a pact. And, and what I proposed to the, the, uh, to the Cameron administration, and, and they like the idea – I mean, I don't know if they On paper, it. yeah, on paper, yeah. Go ahead. No, no, they <laughs> like it. They are, they are, I mean, if they called me to go there, visibly because... That's a good sign. Because they want, uh, they want to really, to do something. They want to, uh, to go after size. Size is their big enemy. Yeah. <laughs> and before that, they had romantic arguments about small is beautiful before these convexity effects. And, uh, and, and I said, okay, it's very simple. You take a company, you certify whether, if this company fails, you can easily, you don't know if it's going to fail, but you know, should it fail? Okay, the taxpayer has to bail it out? Yes, no. If you think the taxpayer would need to bail it out if it fails, then automatically, automatically, the employees can no longer get bonuses. Yeah. Effectively, they are de facto potential civil servants. And you can't play, play the, uh, the long option game at the expense of taxpayers. Remember, my ethics pr problem is someone who owns the option at the expense of taxpayer or someone else. Right. You see, that would automatically force companies to be at such size that they won't be bailed out. Yeah, I'd it's say. a very nice pact you make with a company. You say you could do whatever you want. Pay, you know, you can pay each other as much as you want. We don't care, provided, okay, we don't deem that you are to be bailed out. Now, of course, it's a gray area. There are gray areas. But for a lot of companies, we know very, it's very visible. We know uh, we, we know with Detroit. We know with the banks. Yeah. We know we're going to bail them out. Therefore, they're civil servants. Yeah. It's, okay? It's, and by forcing them, by now, by putting uh, uh, caps on how much banks can pay in bonuses, people are moving to hedge funds. The risk is flowing to the hedge funds. And these are not to be bailed out. Great. Yeah, let them go. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, so I'm not asking to regulate society. I mean, the, the government can use something right, to protect citizens from large corporations, not exacting a rent uh, uh, directly in proportion to their size. Yeah, that's an interesting way to give – take – it's a way to limit their size organically, in theory at least. It's a way to to discourage them from growing because they, they realize if they do, they'll lose their opportunities for the upside. Exactly. They, they no longer can use the option, the free option on society. Yeah. Or do what I call it Bob Rubin. Bob Rubin had $120 million in bonuses, um, uh, you know, retroactively uh, financed by the taxpayer. Yeah, I know. It's yeah, we depressing. have to eliminate the Bob Rubin problem. It's very depressing. Yeah. Well, you know, when you're talking about um, modernity, which is we didn't talk very much today, but, you know, your your insights into our culture and and the um, the clamor by experts for solutions that they claim are scientific. And it reminds me of uh, The Second Coming by Yates, where he says the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity and I, 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 it saddens me how overconfident so many people are who have no grounds for it, and how cautious um, or lacking in conviction are the people who really understand the uh, the limits of our knowledge. So, uh, but but you, you see, at, at some point, then you know, things can change because you can have. Um, we think that that systems can can survive for a long time while being uh, weak like that. They can't. Fragility will will get you eventually. For one thing, let me can I can I mention something to have time to talk yeah. about modernity? Go ahead. Modernity to me, I lump modernity with in a lot of things. The rise of a nation state. That's the first thing. Top down government. Yeah. In the past, we had some top down governments, but the government did not have the means. To, to, to really run the place. France, on, even under Colbert, okay, could not reach provinces, only a few cities along uh, the tax route, you see? This is why France had 400 cheeses and about 72 dialects. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Those are the so good old days. Of, sorry? The good old days. Good old days. So, so modernity is the rise of a nation state, militaristic nation state, of course. Uh, of course, the uh, uh, rise of, uh, you know, um, the, the, the expert, the predictive met- method, pseudoscience, the rise of social science, and, of course, uh, the no skin in the game. All di- diseases all. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, this is is, all, this is, <laughs> they're all dangerous. They're all dangerous. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, uh, the bailouts, and, of course, the thing will destroy itself. And what will replace it? Uh, or, I mean, I, I see the future very positively. You'll have uh, more and more artisans. You know, we at no point in time, you know, we've, we've never been that rich yet. We've never been uh, more in debt. <laughs> you see? Yeah. So when 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 the dust settles, we'll have more robust systems. Robust systems, more and more artisans, in the sense that people really liking what they do. Uh, that's sort of my definition of an artisan. It doesn't have much to do with, with scale. Again, when I talk about scale, scale is specific to the industry or specific to the type of uh, function. You see, you have uh, the death of a nation state, which we're witnessing, the rise of local government, and of course, uh, the, 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 the end, the utopia for me, is what we're seeing, starting to see in Europe now. They're all talking about golden rules, and the golden rule is not uh, Rabbi Hillel's uh, golden rule. The golden rule is no government deficit. Yeah, that's okay. a good heuristic. No government deficit makes things a lot less fragile. Yeah, it's a good heuristic. Yeah. yeah, so very simple heuristics. Again, solutions can only come from very simple heuristics. That's what we've been doing now since civilization started. Since and 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 and, and of course uh, the the. The, the, the codification that, that we have, the first, you know, the earliest one that extant is Hammurabi's law. Uh, here's a little postscript that um, the, uh, when we ended the interview, Nassim wanted to say something else about Seneca. Go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, most people don't understand what Stoic is, and they think that a Stoic uh, wants to uh, sort of be robust, no positive nor negative emotions, get rid of. Uh, Detachment from the world. 
it, yeah, exactly. So, so in other words, become a vegetable, and and that's that's the impression that for a long time, for about two thousand years, we had of the Stoics, mostly because nobody really read them, so or people kept commenting on on comments. But when I read the, the best expositor of the st- Stoicism, the best two expositors actually, Marcus Aurelius and uh, Seneca, and and probably also to some extent Cicero, I realized these are not that type of people. Very different. And, uh, and, and now, uh, recently, I saw some papers confirming my idea that, that what, what Seneca was is about being long options. He wanted to keep the upside and not be hurt by the downside. <laughs> That's it. It's just how to set up his method. Seneca was the wealthiest man in the world. He had 500 desks, okay, on which he wrote his, uh, his uh, letters, uh, uh, talking how, uh, about uh, about how good it was to be poor, okay, <laughs> and, and and people uh, found inconsistency, but they didn't realize what Seneca said. He was not against wealth, you see, and he proved you know that that effectively one one that that uh, that uh, philosopher can have wealth and can be a philosopher. What he was about is dependence on wealth. He wanted the upside of wealth without its downside. And what he would do is. He had been a shipwreck uh, before. He would uh, uh, fake like he's a shipwreck and travel uh, like a shipwreck once in a while, and then he would go back to his, um, you know, villas and and, uh, and and feel rich. He would write down, uh, write off every night before going to bed his entire wealth as a mental exercise. He would just as say, a mental I'm exercise poor. and wake, wakes up rich. Yeah. So he was, he was, it was, they kept the upside. In fact, what they had is, uh, my, my summary of what the Stoics um, uh, uh, were about is, is as follows. I mean, the people who really had, it was like Buddhists, that was an attitude, wanted to have the last word with fate. Mm-hmm. And my definition is, as I said, they're, they're a, a Stoic sage is someone who transforms fear into prudence, pain into information, mistakes into initiation, and desire into undertaking. So it's very different from the, the Buddhist uh, idea of someone who is, you know, p- completely separated from uh, worldly sentiments and possessions and uh, and thrills. It was very different. It's someone who wanted the upside without downside. And Seneca proved it. And the way you get there, is Seneca suggesting, is through mental uh, exertion, through, well, not through necessarily – some of it's action, obviously – but some of it is the way you look at your life and what you prepare yourself for and what, how, you, how you affect your expectations. Exactly. He understood the hedonic treadmill you know, that uh, Danny Kahneman uh, rediscovered uh, about 2,000 uh, 2, years later. He understood it very well. And he understood that uh, wealth, he said, well, you, you're in debt when you have wealth, whether you are in debt from, you know, just debt from others or from fortune, <laughs> you see. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to write off. That, uh, that 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 uh, fortune, and he wanted to remove his dependence on fate, on randomness. He wanted to have the last word was randomness, and he did. Not a bad goal. My guest today has been Nassim Taleb. Nassim is the author of the eventually to be published Anti Fragility. It is a it's a book that bristles with ideas, and many of them, besides making you think, are actually helpful in everyday life, and maybe uh, helps you vote right. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to the final version, Nassim. Thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot for listening to me before the book's completed. Take care. Thanks. Thanks a lot. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.